Good evening to each one. We are glad that you are here and we're thankful that we have the opportunity that we do to be able to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. You know, this morning I got ready to come up to the pulpit area and to preach, and I don't know why exactly I did it, but I'd worn a watch and I decided I'd just take that off and just put it in the seat beside me and then I'd just come up here and I'd put it back on when I sat back down. I took my watch off and my wife Tammy said, oh no. <laughs> so I told her, I didn't even bring one tonight. And my dad said, here, you can borrow mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. Let's open our Bibles up to the book of Revelation, to chapter 3. And I want to spend some time this evening looking in verses 1 through 6. We're going to talk about the church at Sardis. We've been looking at these letters, these addresses that Jesus gives to these seven churches of Asia. We would call them Asia Minor in the area that's known as Turkey today. And we have seen Jesus addressing each of these congregations. And, and really in doing so, he's addressing the church throughout the world. And not just in that day, but in our day as well. Because many of the struggles that they face we still face today many of the temptations that they endured we still go through the hardships and difficulties and the good things that were there those are good things that we need to be involved in and so there is so much for us to glean as we look at jesus speaking to each of these congregations and he's trying to encourage them and remind them that we win. You know, in that first century, as the church is facing such hardship and persecution and, and the enemy seemed to be growing in power and things were getting harder and harder on Christians, it seemed like maybe the church was going to go out of existence. Maybe, maybe Rome is going to conquer. Jesus wanted them to know that's not the case at all. Yes, it may look that way. And the things that are going on, they're going to continue for a little while longer. But my judgment will come upon this enemy, and they will be defeated. Judgment will be given unto them, and the church will overcome. And if you'll remain faithful to me, you will be victorious. And so he writes this letter of great encouragement here at the close of our Bibles. I hope we're trying to remember just one or two ideas about each of the congregations that are addressed. We've talked about four of them already. There's the church at Ephesus. That was the church that had left its first love. And then there was the church at, at Smyrna. Remember, they were a poor church in the world's eyes, but Jesus said, you are, you are rich. They were the rich, poor church. And then there was the church at, at Pergamos, where Satan's seat was, and they had problems with the doctrine of Balaam. And then there was the church at Thyatira, and they had that woman Jezebel that they had to deal with, that false teaching there. That leads us to his address to the church at Sardis. Sardis was the capital of Lydia in that area. It had a very rich history. It was a place that was known for, for business for a long time. There were about five major highways or roads that led to Sardis. And so there was a great deal of commerce in this area. It was a place that had a stream that flowed through the city that actually was a, a source of gold. And probably their most well-known king was a king by the name of Croesus. And still today, there are people who will say something along the lines that that person was as rich as Croesus because he was known for all his gold. You look at the picture that's up on the screen. I guess it's not a screen, it's the wall. But you see that picture, and that's actually a picture of the Acropolis or what remains of the Acropolis of 
of Sardis, the city that was built up on these cliffs, the top of them. They were over 1,500 feet above the plains below. And because of that, it was a city that was almost impregnable. I, I mean, three sides of the city you could not approach. And the one, it could be easily defended. They took great pride in the idea that they were a city that could never fall. And yet, they had, not once, but twice. Cyrus, in about 4 or 546 B.C., was able to take the city because they failed to watch. They didn't set the guard. And so the enemy was able to take the city without much of a fight at all. Over 300 years later, Antiochus the Great was again able to take the city for the same reason. In the year 17, while Jesus was upon the earth, there was a great earthquake, and it destroyed the city of Sardis. But the emperor of Rome, Tiberius, had the city rebuilt. And it had a name that it was thriving, but it was on the way down. It was a dying city. It wasn't going to continue as things went on. And Jesus is going to use some of those figures to try to bring home a message to the church at Sardis. And so with that in mind, let's kind of look at what Jesus had to say in verses 1 through 6. Revelation 3, verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In Revelation 1 and verse 4, mention is made to the seven spirits of God. And it's a reference unto the Holy Spirit. Now we know that there is only one Holy Spirit, but he's made reference to in this way because of his perfection. Remember, this is a book that's written in symbols and those numbers, seven, carried with it the idea of perfection. And so he is the one who has the seven spirits of God or the the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is ready to do the bidding of the Lord. And He is the one with the seven stars. We're told in Revelation 1, verse 20, that the, the seven stars are the seven angels, the, the seven messengers. This church, and we're going to learn that this church is identified by Jesus as a dead church. A dead church. But the thing that could bring them back to life, that could ignite the sparks that were about to go out, is the Word of God. The Word given by the Holy Spirit and those faithful messengers, preachers of the Gospel. Jesus is the one who's given that Word. It's His Gospel. And it is that Gospel that can give them life. And so he identifies himself in this way. He tells them, like he said to each of these congregations, I know thy works. He says that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. By reputation, they seem to be alive. A an active church, a, a great church. From the outside, things looked good. We don't know exactly what that might have involved. But they were a congregation that evidently people could look to and, and think everything is great. That's what the church ought to be. Maybe, maybe they had great facilities. You know, a lot of people mistakenly think that a big building or a big complex means that's a good church. That that's the, the gauge of a, a good church, how big it, it is as far as the building or, or maybe in numbers. I think I've told you this before, but when I first started preaching, I preached for a congregation of 500 people. 500 folks. We moved not long, uh, at, well, not long, about 10 years later, and uh, it went to a congregation of about 450 people. And then we moved to 
New Philadelphia, and there's about 180 there, 160, 180. And I tell people those things, and they look at me and say, Aw, you got demoted? You know, they may not say that, but you can almost see that that's what they're thinking. Well, what happened? Did you get in trouble or did you mess up? What, what's, what's going on? Well, that's, that's the world's gauge of things. And to look at the church at Sardis, they had things, whatever they might have been. Maybe it was, maybe it was influential people, big names. Maybe they were a congregation that had a lot of money. I, I don't know. The world looks at things differently. And Christ said, you have a name that you're alive. But Jesus said, I know your works, and you're dead. They were suffering from dry rot. They were rotten on the inside or dying on, on the inside. And so here's the church that's known as the dead church. You know, most of the time, as we look at these letters, Jesus commends the congregations. He has something good to say, and then he challenges them with the things that they need to change, where there needs to be repentance. He doesn't do that with Sardis. You have this reputation, but he says, I know you, you are dead. Verse 2, be watchful. Now that was something that people at Sardis, they were, they were tender to listen to. Those words, be watchful. Remember, they had fallen twice because they had not been watchful. They hadn't set the guard. And, and Jesus here is kind of playing on that, what's happened to them in their history, something that they would be familiar with. And so he tells them, you need to be watchful. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Even though Jesus identifies them as being dead, he says they're not quite gone yet. You might think of a, a fire where the, the coals are just about ready to turn into ashes. But if they can be stirred, if they can be fanned, if they will change, they can be revived. And that's what Jesus is saying here to the congregation at Sardis. You be watchful and let's, let's revive these things. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. That idea of perfect carries with it the idea of completeness. They hadn't finished the works that God had given. They'd started out well. Maybe a lot like Ephesus who had left their first love. They started well, but they had not brought those things to fruition. They had not completed the work that God had given unto them. Jesus says, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Repent. I heard a sermon one time, and it was entitled, The Most Difficult Commandment. And it was about repentance. Repentance. When you think about God's plan of salvation, the gospel plan of salvation, I really don't think it's very hard for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There's so much evidence that is given. You have to be pretty hard-hearted to look at what's given and, and, and come away saying, no, I, I don't believe. All the miracles that he performed, the work that he did, his resurrection, he showed it over and over. It's not hard to believe. And it's really not a difficult thing to, to confess Christ before men. Not if we believe that. Oh, it, it, it may be hard for some because they're not used to being in front of others, but, but to confess our Lord, that, that's not a hard act. And baptism itself isn't difficult. I mean, you just allow yourself to be submerged underwater. And especially if you're not afraid of water. My, my wife is terrified of water. And when she was baptized, I, I wasn't there. I didn't know her at the time. But she tells the story that when she was baptized, you know the first thing she did when she came up out of the water? She threw up. 
She'd scared herself so much of that water that it, it just made her sick. Uh, did you get out of the water? No, oh, she didn't even make it out of the water. Okay. You, you didn't want to be baptized after her. All right. But, but that's really not a hard act. It's repentance. That's where the changing takes place. That, that's where we have to, to stop doing the things that we were doing, living sinfully, and now we're going to live godly lives, living for Christ. And the church here, they needed to repent. They, they needed that penitent heart. And my friends, I hope the church here will always have hearts that will repent. That we're not filled with pride to the point where we think, oh, we, have ne we'll ne we never do anything wrong. We don't need to change. We don't need to repent. We no, let's have those penitent hearts. I believe it's one of the things that made David a man after God's own heart. And I, I want us to have those penitent hearts always. And so he calls on them to watch, he says, if therefore thou shalt not watch. Again, remember, they were taken because they, they didn't watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This isn't the second coming of Christ that's being made reference to, but it is his coming in judgment against them where their candlestick will be removed. They won't be the church of Christ anymore. They won't belong unto him. His judgment will come upon them. He does say to them in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, which really indicates to us that many of them had. Many of them evidently were living just like the world. But there were a few, he says, that have not defiled their garments. They were being faithful unto the Lord. He says, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus says of these people, they are worthy. You know, the Bible lets us know that there's a sense in which none of us are worthy of eternal life. It's not something that we deserve because we're so good. But the Bible also lets us know that we can become people who are worthy. And that happens when we put on Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. It's in Christ that we are made worthy. Not on our own, but in Him we are worthy. And that's what Jesus says about those who have not defiled their garments. They are worthy. They're abiding in Christ. And that's a challenge for us today. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, purity, holiness, victory, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. All right. What does that mean for those who don't overcome? If Jesus says, I won't blot out the name of those who do overcome, those who continue in faithfulness to me, what's the implication for those who do not remain faithful? that their names will be removed, that it will be blotted out. That's what he's saying. But for those who overcome, their names shall not be blotted out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Remember Matthew 10 and verse 32 and 33 where Jesus reminds us that if we will confess him before men, he will confess us before his Father. But if we deny him, he will deny us before his Father. Here we're reminded that if we overcome, Jesus will confess us before his Father and the angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
And so in these six verses, Jesus addresses the church that really is known as the dead church, the church at Sardis. Let me share three thoughts with us before we close as we look at these verses. Number one, I think we need to understand that we can be dead while we live. He says that really about the church at Sardis. They had a name that they were alive, that thou livest, he says in verse 1. But he says, thou art dead. They, they were dead while they were living. We know, or at least I hope that we understand, that when we are outside of Christ, that we are dead spiritually. Because we're separated from God. Sin separates us. We don't have that right relationship with God. And so we're dead spiritually. Here were people who've obeyed the gospel. They were members of the church. But Jesus says, you're dead. They had gone back into the world. You know, this was a congregation that... By looking from the outside, things look good. They were, we would say, a peaceful congregation. There wasn't any trouble there. You notice in this address, they didn't have trouble with the Jews persecuting them. They didn't have uh, any martyrs here. They didn't have that kind of thing. Why didn't they? The likelihood is they didn't have those things because... They weren't doing what Christ would have them to do. Jews didn't worry about them or those that might persecute them because they weren't making any difference. Maybe no one even knew that they were there. They were happy just to have the members that they did and go through the motions they were going through and just continue in that way. They were peaceful. But folks, they were peaceful like a cemetery. They were dead. And so Jesus wants them to, to change that. Remember and let's stir up those things that you did before so that you can have life in me. But the Bible makes it very clear that we can be dead while we live. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, we're told about the widows, the care for the widows. Paul writes to Timothy about that and he gives instructions about those that should be included in the number and those that shouldn't. And as he speaks of some who were, were not living the way that they should, he says in verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. He's talking about living in sinful pleasures. And he says of her, she's dead while she lives. I don't know what created this, but you know, we live in a world that is just crazy about zombies. I, 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 I don't get it. I, I really don't. But I mean, entertainment world, the movies and television shows, that, that's a big deal. The, the idea, I, I know that on the American, uh, AMC, whatever that stands for, there, there's a show called The Walking Dead, right? And there's some folks that just can't get enough of that. I mean, they even have shows that talk about that show. You know, I, they, they just, they, I, I, don't, I don't get it, you know. But, but here are these, I, Tammy was teaching the other day, and she's teaching online. You know, that's the way they're doing it now. And she was with one of her students that she was working with. She's able to work with them individually. And I don't remember exactly what happened, what they were talking about, but he read something and then he said, and yeah, that's a sign of the zombie apocalypse. He's a third grader. And that's what he's concerned about. You know, he thinks it's coming, you know. And well, the Bible's been talking about zombies for a long time. Not physical ones, but spiritual ones. Being dead while you live. And that's where we're at outside of Christ. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1, Paul 
would remind the Christians there of where they were before they obeyed the gospel. He said, and you hath he quickened, that is, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so we need to be on guard. Paul writes here and reminds us of man's situation before he obeys the gospel. And Jesus says to the church at Sardis, you're a dead church. You're dead. We can be dead while we're living. I don't know all that was involved in what made them a dead church. Maybe they weren't being evangelistic the way that they needed to be. Maybe they weren't spending time in God's word the way that they needed to so that they could grow. Maybe they weren't worshiping properly. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11, I think it is, we find that there were some in the church that were asleep or they were dead because they weren't observing the Lord's Supper properly. And so all these things would add to that. And then we know that some had defiled their garments. They must have been living like the world, no different than the world. And so Jesus says, you, you've got this name that you're alive, but you're dead. And I hope that will serve to, as a warning, not just to this congregation, but to every congregation of the Lord's people. We don't want to just have the appearance that we're alive. We want to be living for our Lord, active in serving Him. And so let's let Sardis remind us of what we don't want to become. The second thing that I want us to see is the idea that we want to walk with Christ. Let's walk with Him. There in verse 4, He says, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with Me in white, for they are worthy. They shall walk with Me. Can you imagine, and probably you have, but can you imagine what it would have been like to walk upon this earth with Jesus? I think about Andrew and, and those in John chapter 1 that were disciples of John the Baptist, but when Jesus comes and John points them to him, behold the Lamb which taketh away the sin of the world, they begin to follow him. And Jesus stops and asks them, what, what, what do you want? And they said, you know, we, we want to see where you're staying. He said, come and see. And, and they come, they walk with Jesus. I mean, think about the apostles walking with Jesus. And even after his resurrection, you have the two on the road to Emmaus who walk with Jesus, literally walk with him. You know, later, after Jesus had had gone from their view, they said, we should have known. Weren't our hearts burning within us? But they had walked with him. And can you imagine what that would have been like? And I know there's a sense in which we can only imagine that as far as literally doing that. But folks, we have the same opportunity today that these folks had to walk with Christ. Now to do that, there has to be fellowship. To walk with Christ, we have to be in fellowship with Christ. And the only way we can do that, again, is if we've obeyed His will. There has to be unity, oneness. We're going in the same direction. We're walking with our Lord. In Amos 3 and verse 3, God would ask the prophet of old, can two walk together except they be agreed? If we're going to walk with Christ, we have to walk His way. In Colossians 1, in verses 9 and 10, Paul challenges us. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Walking with Christ, walking in that worthy 
way. Jesus said, you have those who have not defiled their garments, and they'll walk with me. Let's be people who continue walking with Christ. The old song says it so well. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to thee, footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. Let's walk with him. And then the final thing, and you may be ahead of me here. I, I don't know how you listen to sermons. A lot of times when I'm listening to a sermon, I think, I, I, I kind of know what point he's going to make. I, I, I think he will. Um, I know my dad does that. I see him every now and then leaning over to my mom, and I think he's telling her what's coming next. So I'm always glad when I can surprise him, you know. But uh, anyway, if you were thinking about this passage, how could you not think about the book of life? Because Jesus had said there in verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. We must be in the Lamb's book of life. You don't read about it often in the scriptures, but every now and then. You know, the Jews, they, they kept a lot of records. All those genealogies. And you wanted to make sure your name was listed there. Had to do with land and inheritance and, and all this kind of thing. Well, even more than being in those genealogies, we want to be in the book of our Lord. It's mentioned several times in the book of Revelation. I want to share a couple of those times with you. One is in Revelation 20 and verse 15, where in that judgment scene, where the books are opened, I believe the books of the Bible, to be judged by, and another book is opened, which I believe to be the book of life. And we read of the judgment that takes place there of, of the wicked. And in verse 15, the Bible says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's a song that we sing sometimes that asks the question, Is my name written there? That's what we need to think about. Is my name in the Lamb's book of life? You know, we concern ourselves about a lot of things as we go through this life. But you know, at, at the end, whenever that may be, what's really going to matter? What kind of car you drove? How big the house you lived in? The places that you went to? No. The only thing that's going to matter is if our name is in the book of life. That's it. If our name is not there, here is our fate. Revelation 21, verse 27, as he describes heaven, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If our name is there, we get to enter into that heavenly home. If our name is not there, we'll be cast into that lake of fire. The church at Sardis was reminded that if you overcome, I'll give you the white raiment, and I'll confess you before my Father, and I will not blot out your name from the book of life. My friend, can you say that you know your name's there? Not because of some feeling that you have, but because you've obeyed the will of God and you're remaining faithful to Him. Our name needs to be in that book of life. I hope that we can truly say what we sang a few moments ago. My name is written there. Because like I said, that's the only thing that's going to matter. 
And so tonight, as we've talked about the church at Sardis and discussed these things, my friend, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we're going to sing this song for you. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to take that step so that your name might be written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're one who has obeyed, but you've fallen away and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. Will you think about those things? If you need to respond, you do that this evening as together we stand and sing.